So hello everyone. Thank you for joining. Today we are pleased to welcome Loïc Landrieu from IGN, um, the French Mapping Institution um, in the seminar. And uh, so Loïc uh, Landrieu is a researcher there. He did some great work on uh, um, point cloud segmentation uh, prior to the deep learning uh, era in uh, 3D analysis. And they will now present the more uh, modern uh, way to, to deal with uh, 3D data. Mm -hmm. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, indeed, I'm old enough to have been there before the deep learning uh, era. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about how we can apply deep learning for 3D data analysis. So a quick uh, uh, introduction and about what has been said. So indeed, I'm a machine learning computer vision researcher at uh, IGN. Um, my focus is on uh, remote sensing applications. So I work a lot with 3D, either for urban, so indoor, outdoor, and also um, forestry data. Uh, I have an INR grant called Redis 3D um, that deals with a dynamic 3D. So when we have XYZ, but also time. So how can we do a four times semantic segmentation, four dimensions, for example. And I work a lot as well with a satellite image uh, time series for crop mapping and uh, land use. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why it's important to do uh, deep learning on 3D data and why 3D data are especially relevant now. And then I will present a quick overview of uh, the methods successful methods to apply deep learning for 3D point clouds. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of my work on how we can scale uh, these methods to uh, truly huge point clouds. And finally, if I have time, I'll talk about uh, other applications. So uh, first, the uh, context. So you've all uh, heard and uh, are familiar with uh, deep learning. So um, basically, a deep to me, the main difference in deep learning is that instead of doing the, instead of making the descriptors by hand, we learn them. We give to the to the network the raw data, and the network is in charge not only of doing the tasks, the classification, and the regression, but also to extract meaningful and rich uh, descriptors from raw data. Um, it's work, it works fantastic for a lot of uh, perception-based um, applications, for example, images, sound, music. Of course, in a, a language, a very impressive uh, result res recently on uh, natural language processing. So we'll, it took a longer time for this deep learning to be applied to 3D data. Um, so we can wonder why is, uh, is 3D data fundamentally different from uh, uh, 2D? And uh, how can we still apply uh, the, the deep learning paradigm to 3D models? So we are living now through a really a revival, a boom of the uh, 3D mod modality is becoming very popular. And I think there is uh, three main reason, reasons. The first is uh, technological. LiDAR sensors are getting cheaper, but also more efficient. For example, now we have a single LiDAR photon that can detect a single photon bouncing back on the, on the surface. So this is uh, incredible density. Uh, the industrial applications are, are huge, of course, of the most driving, but also a lot of interest in uh, digital twin modeling for um, private and industrial facilities, for example. And Earth monitoring in a uh, three dimension is also uh, very exciting uh, prospects. And as I will try to show, uh, methodologically, methodologically, it's a very dynamic uh, subfield of computer vision, machine learning. People are, are getting really excited about uh, the new 3D data set on uh, applications and method, and it's really becoming one of the gold standards uh, modality, uh, along with uh, image and uh, um, sound and, and NLP. Um, so this combination of, uh, um, of technological uh, advances, industrial applications, and methodological dynamism uh, means that uh, this modality attracts a lot of attention, as it should. So now let's address why 3D data is so much harder to deal with than images. So the obvious one is the scale. Uh, an image typically uh, um, that we encounter in computer vision has at most a million pixels. Uh, point clouds can be much, much larger than that. And it's not uncommon to encounter 
uh, point clouds that with hundreds of millions of points. So already here we have a scaling issue. Uh, we are not going to be able to apply out of the box so the same paradigm that works in, in 2D because we are a couple of magnitude too large. Obvious as well, we don't have a regular grid for pixel. We uh, we know that for pixel there is a pixel above, uh, below, right, and and left. So we know that we know that there is a, this kind of structure for point cloud. We we, we have uh, zero dimensional points that live in a three dimensional space, and um, it's a bit uh, not not easy to predict. There is not a, a easy structure uh, on how they're positioned with respect to one another. So we don't have a regular grid. So applying the fixed kernel uh, paradigm that uh, is used in for, for images is not going to not going to cut it here. We have a permutation invariance, so this can be a little bit abstract, but uh, as we will see, it's actually very fundamental here. In images, uh, the position of pixel on the in the indices are increasingly linked. In for point cloud, it's not the case, so it doesn't really matter how we decide to index a point cloud. So if we say this is the first point, second point, third point, etc., or if we uh, start here, or if we do a, a random indexing and then we, per we per permutate everything, it doesn't change the nature of data at all. Okay, so if we consider a point cloud as a list of coordinates, and we when we feed them to a neural network, the, the operations that the neural network uh, do does must be invariant by a permutation of the indices. Otherwise, uh, it won't work. So as we will see, it's a very structuring invariance. And of course, in an image, if you permute the indices of the index, you permute the position, and you just end up with RGB soup from which you, you cannot tell everything. So again, this is a really important difference. Then the data, uh, the point clouds are typically sparse in the sense that no matter what you use to acquire your point cloud, it can be a LiDAR, it can be a stereo vision or SLAM, surface formation, etc. What you capture is a surface. So we have we we have a 2D surface in a 3D world, which means that almost everywhere in our 3D volume, we don't have points. So we have to be very careful with the kind of method that we use. Otherwise, we're going to spend a lot of compute on memory, uh, just uh, processing just air, just emptiness. So um, this is a, a very big difference with images, for which all the pixels have information a little bit by, by definition. Uh, by construction of the sensor here, most points in space don't have information. So we have to have uh, to, to have efficiency. We have to build this into the network. We have variable density. So if we are close to the sensor, for example, here, uh, we have the road with a, a lot of points, so very high resolution, very, very uh, good density. But if we are far away, for example, here, um, we, we can even see the acquisition lines and it's very sparse. It's, it's not dense at all. However, this is the same road. This is just as much uh, a piece of road as this is a piece of road. So it is important that the networks uh, that we use are very resilient to change uh, changes in density. We also have acquisition artifacts. So you can have with uh, any modality you have this, but in 3D, I think in particular, um, especially if you have reflective surfaces, for example, uh, uh, windows or uh, car windows, uh, the lidars can bounce off and give you really spurious points. Or if you have people walking while you have your fixed lidar that is uh, rot rotating, you end up with trailing uh, ghosts that you don't really want to take into account most of the time. So you have to be very mindful of a, a very sensor-specific acquisition artifacts. You also have occlusions, so you have occlusions with uh, 2D as well, but in 3D it's particularly jarring. If something is close to the sensor, you're going to, to miss entire part of the scene of the data set. And so you have to have um, algorithms that are very resilient to suddenly big part of the scene missing. And, and um, however, the network must still make, uh, be able to make sense of this. So those are the main reasons why uh, 3D is so hard. However, as uh, we see, it's nothing uh, that we cannot overcome. I'm going to talk briefly, briefly about the traditional approach. So the idea um, was to, of course, build uh, the descriptors features by hand. So you take uh, each point and you look uh, at uh, the ne neighborhood and you look at the position of the, of the neighbors and maybe the color and you detonate everything in a, in a smart way to obtain a little descriptor of the geometry and the local geometry and radiometry. 
of the, of the point, and then you feed this to like uh, your favorite classifier, which is random forest, and uh, you end up with this uh, usually quite bad uh, um, classification, which you can improve by uh, increasing the special regularity. You can do that with uh, graphical models or directly by um, structured uh, graph structured optimization. Um, so we had we had a paper uh, about this just before the start of the deep, deep learning for uh, 3D data. And so usually this works okay, but uh, it turns out that um, humans, or at least us, are not that good at uh, devising expressive and rich uh, descriptors. And uh, machines, when you give them a lot of data, are much better at creating very powerful descriptors that can be really suited to the task at hand. So this leads us to um, deep learning for 3D point clouds. So what we want is um, to have a network that you feed it a, a 3D point cloud, so we'll see what it means, uh, under what representation, how you can represent it. And you want to have a learned vector, a learned feature vector that tells us what, uh, what was the shape um, of the point cloud. So the first question is, what are we going to give to the, to, to the network? So obviously, if we give it a, a, a list of coordinates, it's not go, going to work out. It's, it's, not a, it's not a good way of uh, representing a point, uh, point cloud for the simple reason that, well, it's in, in permutation in, in, invariant, so uh, uh, you're not going to be able to, to do much with, with this. So a lot of the ideas uh, stem uh, start with, so networks are very good at analyzing images. How can we generalize? How can we apply what works well on images to the 3D modality? So of course, the first idea is you can represent a 3D point cloud by a set of images by taking pictures of, a, of, a, of a 3D shapes from different point of view. The second one is you can discretize your 3D shapes. So you can obtain voxels, which are basically 3D pixels. And uh, then this is more, uh, this is a good structure for applying deep learning as we will see. Then you can, you, you, you can build the convolution that can be applied on a 3D point cloud. So basically, you want your 3D point clouds to be convolutional level. You can learn local geometric and geometric uh, structure in a hierarchical kind of way. So uh, basically, apply the essence of what it means to, to do uh, convolution in practice. Then you can build a graph. For example, you can link uh, uh, each point to the neighboring point. And uh, then you have a graph structure, and you can definitively do deep learning on a graph. And lastly, you can uh, represent uh, the point cloud as a, another set of points, so not a list, but a, a set of coordinates. And we will see that it's uh, also po possible to deal with a set of features. Okay, so I'm going to start with the most obvious one. Uh, if you're familiar with Im images, so a simple way to apply what works in 2D to 3D is to take pictures, right? So this is uh, this was SnapNet. Um, Arguably, maybe the first uh, approach that uh, um, was really able to, to, to process 3, 3D with deep learning in a meaningful way and also scale quite well. So first you reconstruct uh, the surface and then you take virtual snapshots, right? So you take virtual images, you choose a, a, a position for your camera and an angle, and then uh, uh, you take a picture and you feed these images uh, to CNN that are uh, that works well on images. You will make a prediction per pixel, and then you project your pre your prediction back to the to the point cloud. So um, so this is this works, uh, but of course it's a lot of steps. Uh, most of them are, are not uh, learned, right? Um, are not differentiable, and also it's 3D data. It's a 3D world. So every time you take a 2D picture, you lose a little bit of the structure. So uh, even though it was a, a really good proof of concept, a really good idea, uh, this was not the end of the, how can we apply deep learning to switch to deep point class. Then uh, another idea to generalize what works so well from 2D to 3D is simply to say, okay, well, we, we can do convolution for example, by connecting each pixel to the uh, nine pixels from the previous feature map. If you have, for example, a canal three by three, well, why don't we do 3D conversional nets by connecting each pixel to the 27 3 by 3 by 3 voxels in the in the previous conversional map? 
So absolutely, you can do that. You discretize your space, you, you check which um, voxels are empty and which are full, and then you do three 3D convolutions. The problem, it's quite inefficient because as we said, um, 2D surface in 3D space, most of most voxels will be empty, so you will do a lot of convolution in the in the air. Uh, cubic memory requirements, obviously, if you want to multiply by zero resolution by two, you multiply your memory requirements and computational requirements uh, by eight. So not so great. Uh, first good idea is to do an uh, adaptive uh, an adaptive voxelization, so with larger voxels where you don't have a lot of information and smaller voxels where you have a lot of information. Um, oh, sorry. So obviously uh, it's a better idea, it works, but the problem is then you have to do uh, convolution on an oak tree, so it's not super fun, but it can be done. Um, another problem is uh, the oak tree tends to be very sensitive to uh, rot rotations, so um, this was a bit delicate to manipulate, but uh, definitely a good idea as well. And then you had a seg cloud, another good, good idea um, that noted that, okay, uh, we can't have uh, vo um, voxels that are too small, otherwise uh, the memory requirements are going to be too big. So we, we first discretize the scene with large voxels. So it doesn't really ma matter if uh, the memory requirements are large because we don't have so many voxels. We do a 3D component. And um, then we do subvoxel prediction. So in the original paper, they used it with a trilinear interpolation using a CRF, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the general idea is, uh, is good, is you have a rough idea of what's going on in the scene by doing a rough voxelization and a 3D component, and then you do subvoxel uh, classification of the points. And uh, now you have the modern answer, so the probably the, the end uh, of this idea, which was actually to say, if there is a lot of uh, voxels that are empty, we don't need to process them. We don't need to uh, build features for empty voxels because we know that they're empty. So what, what we can do instead is, is be very careful about what computations we, we do, and we can probably re remove 99.99% of the, of the computations if we're being smart about it. So for example, uh, we only uh, know the uh, voxels that are not empty, and we only compute feature maps for those vo voxels, right? And so a very simple idea, uh, very tricky to implement, actually. Uh, the, the idea, to my knowledge, um, came in 2017, and um, still now people, uh, very smart people at MIT and Facebook are, are, are working on the implementation, and. Uh, I, I looked at the implementation and it's not, it's not exactly easy. You, you have to really do smart in the indexing of your, uh, of your convolution using hash maps. And, uh, so very simple idea. We don't waste computation by learning what we know is uh, for the voxels that we know are empty. Quite, uh, quite tri tricky to implement, but it works quite well. And for a lot of the data types, uh, this is probably a very good solution. A, a benefit of this kind of approach is that basically we can take all the wisdom that uh, the researchers have uh, accumulated in 2D and apply it in 3D. We know that uh, to, uh, the ResNet, for example, ResNet 350 or something, uh, works quite well in 2D, where it's completely trivial to uh, adapt ResNet 50 to uh, the 3D. Instead of having a three by three conversion, we now have three by three by three. So it's very, uh, we, we can adapt a lot of the really good ideas to 2D directly to 3D. So a little bit more abstract now, um, uh, an idea was to generalize discrete convolutions to continuous space. So to understand what I mean by this, let's remember what it means to do a convolution in, two, in 2D. So we want to embed a, a big pixel, and for that, we are going to look at the neighboring pixel in a previous feature map. And for each discrete offset, by discrete offset, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, plus one, uh, plus one, plus one, uh, plus zero, plus one, etc. So we just uh, move in a, on discrete step on a discrete grid, and we look at the feature of the uh, of these pixels, and we we multiply each of these features by uh, the the weights, corresponding weights, which define the kernel weights. So we multiply each each one of these features by the kernel weight, and we sum everything, and this gives us the convolution. 
if we work in uh, in in 3D, oh, mess here, but uh, we cannot really do this because there is no reason for the uh, points to be at the discrete offset position. Right, the point can be everywhere. You can have no point above and 15 points on on, on your left, uh, but not exactly on your left. It, it could be the points live in a continuous space, so we don't have these discrete offsets uh, that can uh, make our life easy. So what we do instead is. Um, we de we define uh, kernel points, which also are associated coordinates in three D point in three D space, right? So each kernel points not only have a weight of their own, but they also have a position in space. And then uh, for all points that are neighboring points of the of the point we're trying to embed, we are going to multiply their feature by the uh, corresponding by the corresponding kernel weight. But we're going to modulate this by a proximity function, which is simply a radial function that decreases with the distance. So points that are close to uh, kernel points are going to, to contribute a lot in the sum, and points that are far, not so much. And we do this for all, uh, all the kernel points, right? So you can notice that if you position your kernel points at the discrete offset, and you take for a proximity function you take the Kronecker function, which is equal to one and zero and zero everywhere else, then you end up exactly with a discrete conversion. So this sum uh, disappears. So th this is truly a generalization of a convolution from discrete space, uh, discrete grid, discrete offset to a continuous space. Of course, in 3D, uh, for 3D point cloud, you're not going to take a little triangle uh, like this. You're going to position your kernel point, for example, uh, at the vertices of a regular polyhedron, but you can also learn the position of the vertex. And likewise, for the proximity function, you can simply take a function that decreases with a distance, uh, or you can also learn the proximity function. It's possible as well. So it's a, obviously a very good idea, a very expressive framework that was discovered uh, um, almost uh, simultaneously by uh, uh, Thomas and Alexandre Bruch in 2019. And uh, this kind of a uh, uh, Networks are extremely expressive. It is a little bit harder, I think, to develop an intuition on uh, what kind of uh, architecture works well, because it's not as easy as, as 3D confnets, uh, where we can directly apply our intuition for 2D. But uh, this is uh, one of the uh, top net networks, uh, one of the top ideas. It works quite well. And finally, um, probably the the final generalization, in my opinion, of uh, what it means to do 2D convolutions to a more general set setting is we can consider uh, the grid, the, the pixel grid, as a special type of graph by co connecting each pixel to the adjacent pixel above, left, right, etc. So if we can do convolutions there, surely we can do convolution on a general graph, right? Uh, where we don't have this nice uh, la lattice tr structure. And for point clouds, as I said uh, before, we can consider a point cloud as a graph by simply connecting each point to the neighbors. And so how do we do a graph conversions? I'm not going to explain. Uh, uh, there is a lot of work on graph convolution. It won't fit in one slide, but basically a, a very, very rough idea of how it works. You start to initialize the embedding of each vertex corresponding to two to points with local fee features that describes uh, uh, what, what they are. And then we have a message passing scheme. Uh, each vertex will send to its neighbors a message that will be a function of its current inner state. Basically, uh, the message will be something like, this is how, what I think I am, so I'm telling you about what, what I think I am. When all the messages are sent, each vertex listen to all the messages that were received and pull them. For example, compute uh, an average, a sum, max, whatever. And this gives us an idea of the context, right? This gives us, okay, so this is what I thought I was, and this is what the, my neighbors are telling me. And then the vertices will update the inner representation according to what used to be their inner representation and according to the context. And we, it's an iterative algorithm. We do this a bunch of times. And every time the receptive field of the neuron uh, of, the, of the vertices increase by one hop in, in the graph, and we start to get a contextual um, uh, to, to build contextual representation of each vertex. So uh, there are 
probably 40 different uh, graph convolution schemes. This one is, uh, in my opinion, the, the simplest. There is another one that I really like by um, uh, Martin Sim Simonovsky. It's called edge condition uh, convolution. And the idea is that when uh, Vertex sends messages to its neighbors, it doesn't send uh, um, the same Vertex to all its neighbors. It will be modulated by an edge filter, which will be learned from edge features. So for example, uh, 3D points in, in, in our case, can send a message that is different to a point that is very close than to a point that is very far away, and probably send different me me message to points that are above and points that are below, which is important because, well, we have a graph, but it is definitely embedded in a 3D space where um, the z-axis plays a, an important role. And uh, so finally, I'm going to talk about point nets. So this is not in chronological order at all. Actually, uh, point, point net arrived almost um, first, but it's such a different idea uh, from all the others that uh, I, I kept it for last. All the other one, you can see the reasoning from 2D, trying to adapt what works in 2D to uh, the 3D modality. Here, it's a, a very different uh, idea that I don't really take its roots in 2D. So I, I kept it for the end. So the, the idea is really to implement the permutation invariance, uh, to hard code the permutation invariance directly into uh, the network. So we have a list or well, a set of, uh, of points. For each point, we uh, apply, uh, we learn a point fun function, which uh, will construct a point, uh, a point des the descriptor, right? So uh, Fn describe Pn and F1 describe P1. And here by P1, by P1 and Pn, we can have like a normalized position. If we have color, that's great. If we have LiDAR information like reflectance, uh, echoes, etc., we can we, we can put this. It doesn't have to be a three here. So you can, and then we concatenate everything. So we can note that this is not permutation invariant. If we, if we swap P1 and Pn, we swap F1 and Fn. So this is not permutation invariant. But then what we do is we compute the maximum along the point dimension, right? For each coordinate of the, of the point function, we will only take the, the values for the points which score the highest in this coordinate. So now we have a vector which describes the entire shape. And if we swap P1 and Pn, we swap F1 and Fn, this has absolutely no effect on G. So we can interpret G as a global shape descriptor. And if we want to classify the shape, for example, we just have to, to plug in another MLP uh, to learn a function that will map the shape descriptor to, uh, for example, uh, our class log, log it or something like this. If we want to do uh, point classification, it's a very easy modification and uh, we can do semantic segmentation with this, no problem. So very simple idea. It's uh, literally five lines of code. It's, uh, on, it works surprisingly well. I'm just going to do a little illustration uh, uh, on point net on why I think it's uh, uh, so great. So um, we consider a bunch of shapes. And then we notice that not all points will co contribute to G. For example, um, if a point is never higher than all the other points uh, in any coordinate of the point function, then uh, if we remove these points, we we don't change. We don't change G at all. G is left completely unchanged. So we can remove it. And if we remove all the points for trained point nets that don't uh, affect G at all, we uh, end up with what we call a critical set, which looks a little bit like the shape skeleton of uh, the morphology uh, analysis that was done a few, a few years, three years ago. So this is, and this is for free. On the other hand, we can notice, so it's a little bit more complicated to compute, but it can be done, that we can add points on as long as we don't change the max value here, um, we can add the point and it doesn't change G, right? If we add a point and it doesn't have a highest value for any coordinates of the point function, uh, this will leave G completely unchanged. So we can add all the points and we end up with what looks a little bit like a surface reconstruction, which I find uh, uh, very interesting. But what's great is that we now have the original shape, the critical set, and what we this is called the upper bound shapes. And all these shapes, uh, so these three shapes, these three, three point clouds have exactly the same G here, exactly the same global shape 
this descriptor. Um, even though they're quite different. Here you have uh, maybe 2,000 points, here you have like something like 500, and here you have dozens and dozens of thousands of points. So basically, it's like just because of the way it was uh, construct constructed, we have a built-in robustness to density uh, variation. As we said, it's really important for 3D printers. So just to illustrate how this very simple idea actually has uh, quite a bit of depth, and I think it uh, was really a great, uh, a great little network. And so how can we combine uh, uh, all those little local neighborhood analysis into something that can be used for uh, larger point clouds? Well, uh, the idea is exactly the same than uh, what we do for convolutional neural network. We start by associating each point with a uh, feature, so proposition, color, et cetera, et cetera. Then we subsample the point cloud. And for each point of the subsample point cloud, we are going to look for uh, its neighbors in the full resolution point cloud. Now we can associate a set of points to uh, each point in the subsample point cloud. We can fit them to an encoder, typically a point net, and we end up with point net plus plus. Um, so this will give you a descriptor of the local geometry and rad geometry in the full, um, for each point of the subsample point cloud. You can do that again, and now you end up with a combination of combination of uh, um, the original features. So you, you see it's like a, exactly like the CNN. You trade off some um, special resolution in order to have more meaningful, more semantic uh, des descriptors. In the end, if you want to classify the shape, you subsample until you have just one point, and you do a final encoding, and this point will uh, this, this final point will have a descriptor that captures the entire sheet. Of course, if you want to uh, classify all the points, you just do a unit structure. So, okay, so this is my quick overview of uh, what works well in uh, deep, like deep learning. And uh, yeah, so I said this already. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about my work on how we can scale this to truly large point clouds. So all the methods that I've mentioned uh, they do not scale so well. They're limited to a few thousand of points, let's say 100,000 points if we're being very generous here on a, on a commercial GPU. But as I've explained, uh, this is a few order of magnitude too small if you want to consider very large acquisitions. So you have two strategies. First, you can do subsampling, but usually if you, if you do machine learning and your first step is to discard 99.99% of your data, you're not in a, a really good place. Another idea is to use a, to use a sliding window. So you can, for example, uh, use a I don't know, two by two by two meters little cube that travels here on, on the scene, and uh, uh, you have a network that analyzes uh, what's inside the cube each time. So for a lot of problems, it's perfectly fine. For example, for indoor data, usually it's, uh, it's perfectly acceptable. You can work room by room, for example. For some type of uh, data, this is not acceptable, and you need to have the global structure. For example, if you look at this example here, the only way to know that this is a bridge and not just a road is to have a, an idea of what the global structure of the scene is. For autonomous driving, this can be also uh, very important where you have structuring uh, things like uh, um, the road that is in front of the, of the car and that gives a global context is actually extremely important. So this is why we devise a super point graph. So our observation was here where we have a point cloud with 40 million points. So that's a lot of that's a lot of data. But it turns out the scene is not that complicated. And if we were able to to split uh, to do a partition of this point cloud into simple shapes into into what we call super points by analogy to super pixels um, in in 2D, and if we were able to analyze each of these super points individually and then through the uh, analyze the context uh, by uh, analyzing a graph that simply link each super point to its neighbors. So the big central point here is uh, obviously the, the larger road. So by analyzing each shape in the independently and the context by uh, the graph, we can have a, a really great um, semantic segmentation that scales well. So basically, we've broken down the uh, semantic segmentation of large point, large point clouds into three steps. First, we do the geometric partition into simple shapes. 
So this is obviously, uh, uh, if we have a large point cloud and it's complicated, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, quite uh, computationally intensive, but we can use the fitting algorithm to do that very quickly. And then we have to embed each super, super point. Uh, so since these are a little bit simple by construction, we can subsample a lot. And then let's say we have 1,000 super points subsampled to 128 points. We can fit them to a point net or maybe something else. Uh, and it's very, very cheap to do. And then you can do the contextual segmentation where you have a graph with something like uh, 1,000 nodes and 10,000 edges. This is nothing. It's going to be done in a, uh, almost instantly um, with the graph, graph convolutions. So just to, to illustrate a little bit more, here we have a toy scene with a table and a chair. We first start by um, partitioning into simple shapes that we call super points. We analyze the relationship between the super points. We embed each super point with like a point net or something. And then each uh, shape will send messages to the neighboring shapes. For example, the seat of the chair will send messages to the leg of the chair and leg of the table and back of the chair, etc. which of course we will modulate by uh, well-chosen uh, edge uh, features that we produce edge filters. And so, this is uh, what we did. So one of the questions can be, OK, but how do you do this uh, par partition step? So our first idea was very simple. We compute for each point uh, handcrafted, so like people used to do uh, back in 2017, uh, handcrafted descriptors of the local geometry and right, right geometry. Um, and then we compute a piecewise constant approximation of this C signal on the adjacency graph of all points. Basically, it just means that we are going to put in the same super, super points, uh, points that are that have the same shape, local local geometry, and same color. For example, points of the wall are flat, vertical, and white, so they are going to be put together. A problem? Uh, no, not, 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 not yet. So how do we compute this piecewise constant approximation? We can do this with a L0 cut pursuit, which is a very efficient algorithm to solve exactly this kind of pro problem. So, it's parallel, it's just a, it's graph cut. It's, a, it's very, very fast. And we have a few, a few papers about, uh, about this. It is a little bit more functional analysis oriented. But so the problem with uh, this approach is that if you make errors in the partition, you will be never able to, to correct them because instead of classifying points, you are now classifying super points. And for example, so I said that the wall is flat and white, but the the boards here are also flat and white. So they're going to be put in the same super points and the network will never have the opportunity to even learn what it means to be a uh, whiteboard. So this is, uh, this is really an issue, which leads us to our next work when we ask the question, is it possible to learn uh, how to, to partition? And so we decided that to learn to partition, what we need to do is to learn point features which are homogeneous within objects. So here we have the same object in the whiteboard and we have all the, more or less the same color, even though there are right geometric uh, contrast, but the, the same object. So um, homogeneous within objects and with high contrast at the border uh, of objects. So here we go from uh, a whiteboard to a white wall and the network learns that when we when we are flat and white and there is a very thin brown um, stripe, it probably, probably means that we are changing object, so it needs to have a very high contrast. Once we observe a very high contrast, when we do the piecewise constant approximation, it will, of course, follow the uh, contrast line and we will obtain a learned over segmentation. And this can be learned by a sim very, very simple contrastive metric learning pro problem with a single loss and a very, very small local network. And of course, this works, uh, this works well. You, know, you, you can see uh, an example, and compared to state of the art of uh, point cloud over segmentation, we see that uh, we, we need way fewer uh, super point to achieve the same, uh, the same quality, which is usually described in purity. And here we have another example, of an autonomous driving data set. And we see something interesting for the trees, for example, um, the, the trunk, which is brown and surfacic, and the foliage, which is green and volumetric, are very different in terms of uh, uh, the geometry and the color. Yet the network has noticed that they are usually in the same object, so it has learned to give them the same uh, the same uh, the same embedding. 
And when we do the piecewise constant approximation, we end up with one-to-one -one reconstruction of trees, whereas the other methods really struggle uh, in the foliage in particular. So quantitatively, I think this is more or less uh, chronological. So when we released the uh, super point graph, it was quite a bit, uh, quite a large improvement over the, the state of the art on this uh, uh, indoor da data sets. But then uh, uh, people did better with a, a more powerful network than our uh, point nets. Then we use the learned partition, which allows SPG to be a little bit uh, better. Uh, but then people have done even uh, a more, uh, even more powerful approaches. And uh, I think right now the state of the art is uh, uh, Capicum, which is a learned kind of uh, con convolution, very powerful net network and uh, with a lot of parameters. Uh, on the contrary, SPG is usually quite light, but uh, it depends on your application. Uh, most of the time, uh, something like Capicum or uh, 3D Convnet is now uh, state of the art. Uh, we are still set up the art for this autonomous algorithm data set, but there are others where we are not so good. And here is a very, very large data set with almost a 2 billion points in the, just in the test set. And uh, so we, we, were, we, we had a set of the art with SVG for quite a long time. But recently, a uh, kernel convolution uh, method of uh, finally overtook us. And uh, so this just shows how um, yeah, the, the great ideas of uh, continuous convolution leads to very, very expressive uh, networks. Um, okay, so in practice, which network should you use? Well, it depends on your pro problem. I would always uh, recommend to start with a traditional algorithm because um, you all use uh, deep learning. So you know that uh, um, deep learning can hide issues in the data for a really long time. So always start with the random forest to make sure your data makes sense. And then you can really code a simple point net um, with a sliding window strategy. It will give you a, a rough idea of how good the network is going to be. And then try to try, try to ask yourself, why is your network, uh, why is the point net not working uh, well enough? Is this because your data is too so, so subtle and you need to have a more powerful network? Then you should use a, a 3D point net or a kernel point conversion, these kind of things. And if what you want is faster training on inference, and if you really need to have the global structure and you think it's important for your data, you probably should use a super point graph. And both of these ideas can be combined. You can combine an SPG with a, a KPCon, etc. And so super point graph is here is the repo. If you want to check it out, everything is open source. And uh, speaking of open source, um, so with uh, some colleague of mine, we. Uh, we were complaining how tedious and annoying it is to code uh, deep learning for uh, deep network for 3D point clouds. Most of the time, because there is no standard uh, framework like Torch Vision for 2D, so we, we decided to uh, do the to do the equivalent of Torch Vision but uh, for 3D. And so um, this is what, what they did, and they could uh, very good developers, which uh, could have this very now quite a popular framework, which is entirely open source, and is really meant to facilitate doing um, research, but also productization of deep learning on 3D point clouds. So there is multiple tasks that are supported, and for each task, we have the correct metrics and the correct lo lo losses. It's very easy to do mistakes, and uh, some people have made mistakes uh, uh, in the metrics and loss in the past, me included. So this one has been tested by quite a few uh, uh, users, so I think you can trust them now. Um, we support classification, segmentation, object detection, panoptic segmentation, and uh, point cloud registration. Uh, multiple sort of uh, state-of-the-art network have been re-implemented from scratch. And uh, so for the most complex one, like for example, Minkowski Engine and uh, KPCon, it was uh, quite hard to re-implement them. So we, we asked the authors to help us and they are all very committed and enthusiastic about reproducibility and open source. So they helped us and we were able to, uh, I mean, the developer, uh, were able to reproduce uh, the state-of-the-art results. And so why is it so great to have all those networks that are in the same uh, frame framework? Is that now if you have an issue, uh, if you have a, a task, a program, and for example, you can just use uh, something simple like point plus plus. And if it works with point plus plus, it's going to be very easy 
um, to switch to um, fancier network like Capicon, uh, because can join on uh, on the net, for example. Whereas if you if you have your task implemented for point A plus person, you have to go fetch the different uh, repo that are not meant to communicate with one another and don't have the same data loader, etc. It's going to be very tedious. So the uh, benefit of centralizing everything is that um, you, you have basically the choice between a, a dozen of different state-of-the-art backbones for your program. It turns out may, maybe your problem uh, should use Capicon or Nikoski Engine, or maybe Point N plus plus is great, uh, who, who knows? But at least you can, you can be sure and you don't have an excuse to not try a lot of different uh, backbones. Same for the data set. Adding data sets uh, is quite complicated. It seems like every data set has a different way of uh, including the point clouds. So uh, they have coded uh, um, a bunch of different uh, loaders. And what is great is you can download, clean the data set with the known errors, and even directly submit on the submission servers your, your solution directly from Python. And it saves actually a lot of uh, time and tediousness. And if you are not too uh, versed in, in computer in uh, uh, deep learning, you can also launch experiments directly uh, in one line. Uh, and you can use a very simple interface. And you can even uh, edit the configuration file if you want to change the architecture. And as long as you follow a UNET type architecture, you can go quite far just in text without actually owning uh, uh, a single line. So depending on the time I have left, uh, do I have um, a little bit more, more time? Five minutes? Sure, sure. sure. So I'm going to talk about a uh, very recent work that uh, we did with one of my students and Mathieu Aubry and one of uh, his students. And um, so we had the problem of how can we uh, visualize and annotate a very large collection of shapes. So let's say you're a company and you scanned all your equipment or you just acquired a very large CAD data sets. Uh, for example, the ABC uh, data set is one such uh, and such data sets, and you want to be able to visualize. You, you want to know in a succinct way what's inside your data set. So this is reminiscent of clustering. What you could do is to have an algorithm that uh, put together the things that uh, put the shapes that look the same, and then look at the centroid of each shape to have a rough idea of what's inside the data set. So there is several issues if you want to do this in 3D. First, uh, distance. So here is the exact same share, but uh, chair, but with different rotations and uh, scaling. And if you compute the pairwise distance between these, these chairs, we'll find that they actually have a quite a large distance if you use, for example, uh, the, the classical distance between, between 3D point clouds. And they will even look more, they will have a close, uh, smaller distances with things that are not chair, chairs at all. So if you don't have a good notion of distance, it's going to be quite tricky to, um, to do clustering. Let's say you are able to know to, to group all the chairs in your data set together, and you want and now you look at the centroid, so you, you do the average of all your chairs. Even if you have solved the alignment problem, you will end up with something that is very fuzzy because there are some, some transformation. For example, a chair can have an armchair or not. Maybe half the chair, the chairs have armchairs and half do not. Then you end up with uh, like some kind of a half armchair, which is never present in the data set. So you cannot do an average of uh, three of uh, three D shapes. So what we did instead is um, we use some what we call linear shape families. So linear shape family is defined by a prototype shape and uh, an alignment network which knows how to output a transformation uh, that aligns a prototype shape with an input point cloud. So now you can compute a meaningful distance between uh, between point clouds that gets rid of the invariance by rotation, scaling, etc. And we also uh, have added the displacement field, which means that each point has a direction um, on the way it, way it can go. And if you move all the points at the same rate in, in their respective direction, you are still on the on the linear family, right? So you, you have this kind of affin the dependencies uh, centered around the prototype shape. And of course, you can have several uh, displacement, displacement fields. And basically, what, it, what it this means is that you've defined um, low dimensional affine subspace in the shape, in the space of all shapes. And if you look at what it looks like, for example, here, even though it's completely unsupervised, we've never told the network what it is to be a plane. 
um, the model will find a, a prototype of, uh, of planes. And if you move in this direction, then you change uh, the number of uh, engines and you change the, the, the shape of the tail. And here it looks more or less like a jet fighter. Here for tables, you have this direction that controls the length of the, uh, of the, of the legs, and this one controls uh, their, their width. But again, it's completely unsupervised. So what can you do with this? Um, well, here uh, is some of the shapes that we discovered on uh, uh, ShapeNet, which is a very large uh, 50,000 shapes uh, data set. And uh, completely unsupervised on network, I found out that there are three types of planes. Uh, jetliners, all time planes, and uh, jet, jet fighters, for example. And this can give you a really concise overview of what's in a, a, a data set. You can also use this for semantic segmentation. Uh, instead of annotating a lot of uh, shapes, you just have to annotate the prototype shape. And it's very easy to um, transfer the point label to, uh, to point clouds to the point of point clouds that are close to the to the family. So here you have the ground truth, and here you have uh, what uh, what we have put. And basically, by just annotating the prototype shape, so maybe twenty or fifty of them, just annotating a few shapes, you end up with absolutely state of the art uh, performance for uh, semantic segmentation. Um, okay, so this is it. I'm going to skip that because I don't have time. Uh, but so this is the end. Obviously, I haven't talked about uh, a lot of uh, methods, which are great. The elephant in the room is clearly the 3D transformers. So a really nice idea. Uh, it was very successful in NLP, more recently adapted to images. And so now everybody is trying to adapt them for 3D point clouds, obviously. Uh, very exciting prospects. Uh, semi self and unsupervised learning is great as well. If we can make our own label, like by removing some points or adding orientation on, on things. Uh, this is obviously great because annotating 3D point clouds is a pain. And uh, me, I'm working on domain adaptation. When uh, how can we have a single model that learned um, from different type of sensors, and also multi-source and multitask learning with a, a student of mine, uh, where we combine different mod modality and we perform different uh, tasks at the same time. And here are some of the repos that I've talked about. And uh, if you have, if you have questions, I'm done. Thank you very much, Loic. A really great, uh, great talk. Uh, very dense and full of uh, of insight. Um, is there any question in the audience? Maybe to start uh, to to start it, I uh, I can ask a few questions. Uh, I was uh, I discovered your work through what you did before uh, deep learning uh, using uh, CRF and stuff like that, uh -huh. and and uh, I was wondering, uh, is it? I, I don't find it common to see three uh, D deep learning uh, followed by uh, CRF regularization. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Is it because it's not useful, or uh... so? Um, I think it's a little bit the same for in two D, right? We we rarely interface. Um, graphical models after the uh, to increase uh, the special regularity of images and the same for point clouds. I think not that it cannot be useful. I think for in some cases, especially if we don't have a lot of data, I think it can, it can be a great inductive bias. But the general idea is that you want the, the, the regularity, the special regularity to be learned. So if indeed your data is especially regular, the network will learn to output uh, predictions that are also uh, especially regular. But if you don't have a lot of data, or if you just have a few uh, very sparse annotations, I think it can definitely make sense to to use a CRF or optimization in the end to smooth your data. Absolutely. Okay, and um, also I, I didn't fully understand uh, uh, what you said about uh, point net. Uh, I understood the critical set definition, mm -hmm. but not the upper bound uh, definition. How do you add points? So in practice, uh, I think it's a bit uh, a bit tricky. But just the general idea is, you can notice that if you have the points that don't change the maximum, uh, that, that, that does not have uh, the highest value for any coordinates, 
It doesn't change uh, the global shape descriptor at all. In practice, how do you compute the upper band shape? I think I don't know actually. Must be I, I don't think it's practical. I don't think you, you should use point net to do surface reconstruction. It's more like a, a nice yeah. illustration. Okay. okay. And also in uh, in the super uh, super point graph, can you give us an idea of how many uh, the size of a training set? Yeah, sure. So um, so it really depends. So this data set has a uh, it's the Stanford data set. Uh, it has a signal something like two hundred rooms that have been scanned, something like six six hundred million points. This one is much smaller. I think it's fifty fifty million points, and this one is something like a uh, total four or five billion points. But um, so this is a lot of points, clearly. But it's uh, for super point graph. It, in the end, the graphs are quite small, right? Because here uh, you just have a graph with maybe a thousand vert vertex, and so it's not uh, two billion points that you have to learn on, but only. Uh, 30 graphs with 1,000 vert uh, vertices. So in the end, um, SPG, uh, superpoint graph, can be trained extremely quickly as long as you've done the partition step, which is obviously a little bit long, but you, you have to do it only once. And then you can try a lot of configurations and train it in a couple hours, whereas it would take, it take days with, uh, uh, for example, more complex network like a kernel point convolution. Okay, thank you. And also, I'm curious. You mentioned uh, 4D analysis uh, in your <laughs> introductory slide. Yes. Uh, is it okay to to reveal a bit uh, what you, <laughs> what you want to, to do? Yeah. yeah. So um, a lot of methods right, right now works. Uh, so for, if you consider, I don't know if you're familiar with a uh, 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 lidar, velodyne lidar is, but it's a little rotating laser that you put on top of a car. And uh, so it, ro it rotates, but, on the, but the car moves and the object moves. So it's a quite a complex uh, signal. So usually people classify uh, frame by frame. By frame, I mean a, a complete rotation of the LiDAR, of which there are about 10 per seconds. So either they do the frame by frame, or they merge all the frames to open one different parts. And what we want is uh, to use the uh, so sensor topology, right, the, the organization of, of the points around this, this, this uh, circulation, this rotating uh, uh, acquisition d d device to be able to merge space and time. Okay, thanks. Is there any other question? Um, yes, um, I was curious because um, I think you presented the data sets uh, that are mostly used in the uh, maybe related to autonomous cars. And I was wondering how your super point graph performs on what I would refer to as IGN data, like large fields, uh, like large volumes of fields and forests. And mm -hmm. So, um, others. right. So for um, aerial li LiDAR, which is a, a typical IGN, uh, IGN data, uh, IRL LiDAR are not very dense, usually it's something like uh, 10 or 20 pulses uh, per square meter. So you don't have that many points, which means that you can have a, a very large sliding window. And since you have a large sliding window, you don't lose a lot by uh, using a, 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 sliding, a sliding window strategy. You don't really need the global st structure, especially with the modern networks like Minkowski and Gino and stuff. <laughs> Okay. So, so in the end, I wouldn't recommend uh, SPG for this. I think it would really add a layer of uh, com complexity. Uh, for the forestry data, where we have uh, terrestrial uh, lidars or aerial lidars that are scanning uh, tree on treetops, I think maybe it has more relevance and the kind of things that we are investigating right now. But it's hard to come by with this kind of data. Okay. Like, could you differentiate uh, tree species in a forest to monitor? Uh, That's species. the idea. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and I want, uh, yeah, so thank you for a really interesting presentation. And, this, and I was really um, uh, reactive to the part where you coded everything uh, for the 3D uh, torch. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Well, I, I, I did not, not code. Yeah, the, the developers did and they, they did a fantastic job that uh, I helped them write uh, the, the article. And, uh, but I really, this, if I had this in 2018, it would have, uh, I would have been so, so much more e efficient. So please uh, yeah. do, do take advantage of this if you're interested in 3D. Yeah, and we were confronted to this in one of our projects because, you know, some, some, some data sets, they are provided with uh, images in 2D and 3D. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it also in this, um, if you have a, a data set in 3D, in this um, GitHub repo, can you have also generate images in 2D of the data set to test uh, 3D methods that use 2D images? Or? Mm -hmm. So uh, 2D plus 3D is uh, one of the first work that I'm doing with uh, new students of mine, and it's, it's going uh, quite well. It's not so obvious to, to do, but we are working on it. And have, uh, very encouraging results, and we are working within the framework of uh, TorchPoint 3D. So as soon as it, uh, as we publish the paper, we will uh, release the code that will be directly integrated into TorchPoint 3D, so it, it will be able to to use your code uh, within the framework. Cool. Okay. Okay. okay thanks. Any other question? If not, thanks again, uh, Loïc, for, for this presentation. And uh, see you all next week for a new seminar, which will be on computational agroecology. So thank you. Bye. Bye.